Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this session today. We have Jordan with us, and she's from the Kansas Tourism Department, and she lives in Topeka, Kansas, our capital. Uh, this session is called Road Tripping Your Way Through Kansas History, so let's buckle in and get our brains all warmed up to think about our rich Kansas history, and Jordan, I will give it to you. Perfect. Like she mentioned, my name is Jordan Romerman. I am the marketing manager at Kansas Tourism, and we are based out of Topeka. So I am going to share a little um, a little PowerPoint with you. So bear with me while I'm getting it loaded up. All right. Hopefully you are seeing my screen now and we can rock and roll. So I want you to keep in mind Kansas history is American history and being in the middle of it all means that we have a bit of it all, which is a really, really great um, thing to have for a state because we have so much really rich history and there are incredible locations across the state uh, that you are going to learn about today. And so while we are reflecting on this, um, I'd like for you to either grab a pencil and a sheet of paper or uh, get ready to type in the chat because uh, I'm going to be showing you little video clips um, of tourism attractions across the state that have to do with Kansas history. And I wanna see if you guys know where we're going before it's officially announced at the end. You guys are gonna have to be quick about this because it's only about 12 seconds worth of photos of each location. So you have to really put your brains on um, and think about what location might be popping up. If you have an idea of what it is, Put it in the chat. I'd love to see what some of your answers are as they roll in. So uh, be ready to go. Time is ticking. But first, Kansas is a big state, but how big is it? So it's a huge state to, to traverse. And it, when you're you know, going from Kansas City down to Liberal, that takes a long time for a road trip. So uh, we have 81,736.8 square miles of Kansas. It means we are the 13th largest state by area. So that's a lot of uh, room to uh, cover in a road trip. But what we've done is we've broken Kansas into six easy to travel regions across the state. Uh, so that way you can really tailor your trip to a specific region and not have to drive eight hours to get from one corner to the other. So. Uh, I want you to take a look at the map, identify which county you're from, uh, and thus which region you are in. So if you could tell me which county and which region you're in in the chat, I would love to see exactly where you guys are from. Uh, so that way we can really celebrate this happy birthday Kansas party all over the state. Okay, so first up, we are going to go over attractions in Southwest Kansas. So. Put on your thinking caps. Uh, I will be starting the video here before too long. Again, you have 12 seconds to decide what this location is uh, before you send in your answer. So get to thinking. All right, so it looks like there's people and cowboys. There's a random bison, cowboy hat. Looks a little bit old, tiny, old west. And the answer is Boot Hill Museum in Dodge City, Kansas. So a fun fact is that Boot Hill was the name given to many cemeteries across the world, but uh, a vast majority of what it's famous for are some of the cemeteries uh, in the American frontier, the wild, wild west, where gunfighters and other folks who died with their boots on uh, were buried. So that you'll you'll see boot hills all over. There's a boot hill in Dodge City. There's a boot hill um, in Hayes, but there's really only one place to go uh, to a boot hill museum quite like this. And so Dodge City's boot hill was made famous thanks to the gun, the show Gunsmoke. So this was a an old tiny TV show that ran from 1955 to about 1975, and it really put Dodge City on the map. Um, in terms of, of uh, Wild West locations. But Dodge City was also a pretty familiar face to Wild West history buffs as well. Um, it was known as the uh, wickedest, wickedest little city in the West, uh, the queen of cow towns. 
it had all of this um, all of this legendary stature because of the folks uh, who uh, traipsed through there over its long and storied history. Uh, so the current Boot Hill Museum uh, is is found on the original site of the Boot Hill Cemetery, um, and it really highlights Dodge City's glory days as the queen of cow towns. And so you'll learn about things like um, how cow towns evolved, local history. There's a really cool exhibit that I really enjoy that had the buffalo picture earlier, uh, where you can actually feel the ground shake like it would in the middle of a buffalo stampede. So there are a lot of really cool things to go and do and see. You can grab a bite to eat. You can get a little bit to drink as well as um, watch some unique stage shows like staged gunfights or saloon shows. It's a really, really great time if you're interested in cowboy culture. All right, so next up. Looks like we've got a photograph there. Some, uh, some descriptions. Oh, here is a tunnel, which is a little creepy. It's a museum of some sort. So this is the original Dalton gang hideout uh, in Meade, Kansas. So the Dalton brothers gang was a notorious group of outlaws that specialized in bank and train robberies. Uh, and the Dalton brothers, they really did hit up a lot of locations throughout Kansas. They were actually stopped in uh, Coffeyville, Kansas, which is another really interesting story. But alas, that's not what we're focusing on right here. So uh, the Dalton brothers had a sister named Eva. And Eva settled in Mead after she was married to uh, a gentleman named John Whipple. And so rumors swirled for years in the community uh, because they knew that Eva was somehow related to the Dalton gang. Uh, and so they, they were absolutely certain that this little yellow house on the edge of town was where the Dalton gang would go to lay low after a big hit um, and uh, try to evade justice. And so the, the community really knew that this is something that was happening, but nobody could ever prove it. But Eva and her husband, John, mysteriously disappeared in 1892 after receiving some more heat from the community. Uh, they just packed up and left town in the middle of the night. So after new residents moved into the home, they discovered a 95 foot long secret escape tunnel that went from one of the closets in the home to the barn which for the Dalton gang, this is a really great escape tunnel. Again, it was on the edge of town. They could get out of Dodge uh, right, right before the, uh, the law was able to, to nab them. So uh, this was a long-standing urban myth that was confirmed to be true um, after, after the Whipples moved out. So originally, this was a three-foot-high dirt tunnel, but in the 1940s, they expanded it out so you can actually walk through it um, and you can walk through the, the footsteps of history instead of like crawling through it or scrunching down and, and walking real low. So this is a really cool place to immerse yourself in uh, some more of the uh, notorious Wild West history. So Northwest Kansas. Again, get your thinking caps on. Oh, and I will say, if you don't love creepy crawlies, you may want to avert your eyes from this for the next 30 seconds or so. I'll let you know when it's safe to look, but I didn't want to scare you too badly. All right, so here's some bones, a fish within a fish, Ugh, snakes in a jar, a skull of some sort. And then a giant T-Rex animatronic. So do you guys know where this is located at? I'll give you the answer in three, two, one. It is the Sternberg Museum in Hayes. Because natural history is history too. So this must-see Kansas Museum displays live animals, fossils of 80 million year old sea monsters, and interactive exhibits for all ages. Uh, my favorite exhibit is definitely the Dino Dome uh, that, that you saw the T-Rex from earlier. It's this huge animatronic that moves its head and it always looks like it's looking at you and it'll roar at you. Uh, it's, it's a really cool place to wander through. But probably my least favorite exhibit is a hallway that they have absolutely chock full of rattlesnakes from around the world. They've got more than 40 different species of rattlesnakes and I don't know if it was the day that I went or the time of day that I went, but those were the most active snakes that I have ever seen. 
So if you love snakes, you'll love the Sternberg. It's also famous for its fish within a fish fossil, where a giant fish died shortly after eating a smaller fish, preserving its last meal for millions of years. I, I believe this is the only fossil ever found remotely like it. So this is a unique one of a, a one of a kind experience that you can only experience here in Kansas. And you'll also learn about paleontology um, in Kansas, including the world renowned paleontologist George F. Sternberg, a Kansas native and namesake for the museum and the discoverer of the fish within a fish fossil. The Sternbergs are actually kind of a paleontology royalty family. Uh, they have a lot of paleontologists there, um, but we're really looking for George F. Sternberg, but there's a little bit of family history in there as well. All right, next up, we've got some beautiful rocks and a sunset, uh, some more rock formations, a beautiful scenic overlook. Uh, looks like they're on a trail looking at some stuff. And then again, a beautiful scenic vista. So make sure that you have your answers written down. Where do you think this is? I'm going to switch it over in three, two, one. This is Little Jerusalem Badlands State Park. Again, natural history is Kansas history. And the history at Little Jerusalem Badlands State Park is absolutely breathtaking. There are 332 acres of badlands that are Kansas's most dramatic Neobrara chalk formations. So this is not the only Neobrara chalk formation that we have in Kansas. There are also locations um, called Monument Rocks, which is maybe a 10 minute drive away from uh, Little Jerusalem Badlands. Uh, there's also Castle Rock, which is south of Quinter. They are all grouped together um, in that little area because they were all formed by sediment that settled at the bottom of a vast inland sea that covered most of Central North America roughly 140 to 170 million years ago. So basically the entire western portion of the state used to be the bottom of an ocean. Um, so that chalk sediment had been eroded by millions of years worth of weather uh, and it has formed the 100 foot spires and cliffs that we see in this beautiful breathtaking park today. Uh, this also provides a unique habitat for plants and wildlife, some of which can only be found here in this micro ecosystem. And remember when you go, this ecosystem is incredibly fragile. It's stuck around for millions of years, but we wanna make sure that people can see this for millions of years more. So. When you go, you must stick to the identified trails unless otherwise accompanied by a park ranger. So when you go, uh, enjoy the beauty, but definitely don't disturb it. We wanna make sure that this park is open uh, for Kansans generations to come. So central, north central Kansas. Okay, there's a big white house, something labeled a library. I hate war and I like Ike, champion of peace. And we are officially at the Dwight D. Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum. So Dwight D. Eisenhower was the 34th president of the United States who grew up in the 34th state in the union, Kansas. Again, happy Kansas Day. Uh, that's one of my favorite fun facts about Dwight D. Eisenhower, the fact that he was the 34th president from the 34th state. It's just a really cool piece of, of, of coincidence that has really helped to shape that story. So Dwight was also known as Ike, which became notable during his present presidential campaign with using I like Ike as a slogan. And this is probably the most famous presidential slogan of all time and really uh, has been a, an incredibly influential piece of advertising and marketing history as well. Uh, that campaign is still utterly recognizable to this day. And during World War II, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower served as the Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe and was a five star general in the Army. So, uh, a lot of uh, those successes that we had in World War II, uh, particularly in the European theater, uh, were done under Dwight D. Eisenhower's supervision, um, which is a really cool piece of American history. And after the successes of World War II for Dwight D. Eisenhower, he launched a political career that led to a two-term presidency from 1953 to 1961. 
Uh, and what I think uh, President Eisenhower doesn't get enough credit for is that he was also really instrumental in several civil rights victories, um, including integrating the American Armed Forces uh, and uh, picking some really influential civil service appointments that were vital for civil rights advancement. All right, where are we going next? Looks like there's maybe some Indian artifacts here. Um, there are some buffalo skulls and art. This maybe looks like the floor of a lodge. And so we are officially at the Pawnee Indian Village Museum near Republic, Kansas. This is actually a state historic site and is really truly one of my favorite museums across the state. Um, this museum is found on the village site of a band of the Pawnee tribe. While we don't know exactly when the village was occupied, it was estimated to have been intermittently occupied between 1770 and the 1820s. Um, so this was actually assumed to be a village that was famously visited by Zebulon Pike, who is a famous explorer of Pike's Peak fame out in Colorado. Uh, and because of that association, it was purchased by a family that wanted to preserve the location as it was found due to that connection. Uh, and so while it was later found to be incorrect, this is not the site of that meeting with, with the Zebulon Pike, it did lead to this site being preserved while the site, the actual site of the infamous visit was destroyed by years of cultivation with farming. They just didn't realize the site's importance. And so after years of, of farming, it just wasn't as salvageable. So the building that you see was actually constructed in 1967 and features the excavated lodge floor, which, they actually left many of the artifacts ex in the exact place that they were found as they excavated that, that lodge floor. Um, unfortunately, none of the structures remain at this point, but you can see the holes where the uh, structural supports were, were done. I believe there are like uh, knives and um, all of these other different artifacts scattered around the floor that were left exactly like it was um, when the, the Pawnee, uh, tribes people left for the very last time. All right, so in Northeast Kansas, again, get your thinking cap on. All right, let justice flow like water. You can see there's some segregation news clips. Uh, racism, hall of courage, desegregation. And we are at the Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Site right here in Topeka. So if you didn't know, um, it was lawful for schools to be segregated or separated based on race before 1954. In May of 1954, the Supreme Court ruled in the Brown versus Board of Education of the Pika case that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. Uh, the current site, the, the one that you have seen pictures of, was actually the former Monroe Elementary School, a black elementary school in central Topeka. And so this landmark decision meant that schools were required by law to integrate or let students of all races attend. Um, what many people don't know is the Brown v. Board of Education case that was decided by the Supreme Court was actually a combination of, of five separate uh, segregation related cases from all over the United States. However, really only one of them was outside of the traditionally identified South which was Brown v. Board. And so it was a strategy to pick the one case that wasn't housed in the South because they knew that this wasn't going to be popular, uh, a, a popular case to be decided by the Supreme Court in the South. So they really picked up on um, using the Topeka case as the namesake. And so in this legal briefing, um, there were several other plaintiffs identified for Topeka, but the Brown last name um, was the first one alphabetically. So Oliver Brown was the official um, plaintiff in the case and his daughter, Linda Brown, um, was a third grader who um, was uh, forced to go to an all black school uh, about a mile away from her home um, when there was an all white elementary school about seven blocks away from her home. So they wanted to get her uh, into the school that was closest to their home. Um, and so uh, they joined in on this lawsuit. And so Brown versus Board uh, was born. 
And again, I told you about how President Eisenhower um, was pretty influential in some civil rights movement stuff. Um, and he enforced the Supreme Court's decision, which didn't get a warm welcome in the South, particularly in Little Rock, Arkansas. The Arkansas state governor called out the National Guard to prevent black students from attending Central High School in Little Rock. And President Eisenhower responded by deploying federal troops to protect the nine students under armed guard. So again, another little piece of Kansas history in that story. All right, where are we going next? All right, looks like there's maybe some planes. There are definitely planes. Amelia is a big hint here. Again, there's a giant plane. And this is the Amelia Earhart Hair Museum in Atchison, Kansas. So Amelia Earhart was a world famous aviatrix or female pilot that was born in Atchison. She was the first female to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. She set many aviation records. She wrote best-selling books. She was a fashion designer. She founded the Female Aviator Club, the 99s. And probably most famously, she disappeared during her attempt to be the first woman to fly, uh, to fly around the world. And so unfortunately, Amelia and her navigator, Fred Noonan, disappeared in a Lockheed Model 10 E Electra somewhere over the Pacific Ocean. And uh, there are rumors every couple of years that, you know, either Amelia has been found or her plane has been found. Actually, a new crop of rumors just uh, popped up over the weekend. Uh, but so far, nothing has been conclusive. And unfortunately, Amelia and Fred have both remained missing. And so this Amelia Earhart Hangar Museum is a brand new attraction just opened last year that takes a look at Amelia's legacy and joins it with a world-class STEM education. Um, and did we mention that it is home to Muriel, the only remaining plane like Amelia's that she disappeared in in the world? Many of those planes were used during World War II, uh, and so eventually they were scrapped. And so this is really the only one left, and it has been fully restored to what Amelia's plane would have looked like as she took off on that last trip. Um, the, the plane is actually also named after Amelia's sister, Muriel. Southeast Kansas. All right, looks like there's some water and something large here. It's big and it's orange, and it has a scoop. And we are at, I'll give you last guesses. All right, we are at Big Brutus near West Mineral, Kansas. So Southeast Kansas has a really rich mining history and had mines that supplied coal, lead, or zinc. Kansas miners actually produced 50% of all the zinc and 10% of all the lead mined in the United States at one time. So peak mining production was in about 1926. Most mining had ended by 1970 and all mines were closed by 1997. So this is, this is an industry that no longer exists in the area, but was vital to its formation um, and really to its culture to this day. So with Big Brutus in particular, you can see Big Brutus on the horizon for miles before you reach him. He is a Bucyrus Erie model 1850B and was the second largest electric shovel in the world. Brutus stands at 16 stories tall or about 160 feet and weighs more than 11 million pounds. So when Brutus is operational, he had a lightning fast speed of 0.22 miles per hour and cost $6.2 million to construct in 1962, which is about $63 million today. So Big Brutus cost a, a big chunk of change, is a big boy, and he is large. You know that he's large when you go, but you still don't have any idea of the scale of this thing until you stand in its scoop. Um, this is a really cool location. It's got some really great mining history. Um, and the other buildings as well. And you can even sit in the cockpit for, for Big Brutus and pretend like you're, uh, you are, you're digging out some mines. However, my favorite fact is also a little bit sad when you really think about it. So Big Brutus dug his own grave. Um, you saw in one of the pictures earlier that there was a, a shoreline of a little pond right in front of Brutus. And so that was actually the last mine that Brutus dug. 
they eventually filled it in with water so that way he would have a placid little little water feature to look at as he rested um, but he dug his own grave so sad all right so it looks like a rainbow bridge classic car um just this classic americana is that tomater and we are on the kansas route 66 uh, historic byway so U.S. Highway 66, more popularly known as Route 66, was one of the original highways in the United States. It was established in November 1926, so almost 100 years old, and became a popular highway to travel cross country. Um, and it particularly um, helped people migrate west in the 1930s during the Dust Bowl. So the, the full route reaches from Chicago, Illinois to Santa Monica, California, and it extends over 2,400 miles in total, a whopping 13 of which are in Kansas. Um, Route 66 has been dubbed both the Main Street of America and the Mother Road due to its pop culture visibility. And while Kansas only has about 13 miles, it may be the, the like smallest stretch that also packs the biggest punch. Um, in fact, Galena, Kansas was a huge inspiration for the Pixar movie Cars. You might be familiar with it. The original inspiration for the character Toe Mater was found in Galena, and now you can see both the original and the character that it inspired side by side, as well as many other Cars characters sprinkled throughout town. So the community has really braced Cars culture, if you will, uh, and you can find everything from Toe Mater to Lightning McQueen there. All right, and I figured that a lot of you were probably from South Central Kansas, so I saved it for last, uh, just building the anticipation and excitement. So, put on your thinking caps. Where do you think I'm going to go next? Pizza Hut sneakers? A random cash register? It looks like some museum-y type stuff. There is a Pizza Hut sign. We are at the original Pizza Hut location in Wichita. So in 1958, two brothers, one a recent graduate of Wichita State University and another who was a freshman, started a restaurant in a tiny building off of the corner of Bluff and Kellogg. At this time, pizza wasn't as popular as it is in America. So this is really kind of one of the first restaurants of its kind in the area. And from that humble shop in Wichita came the largest pizza restaurant chain in the world. The two brothers, Frank and Dan Carney, sold their pizza chain to PepsiCo for $300 million in 1977, a sum that would be more than $1.5 billion, billion with a B, uh, today. And now that original Pizza Hut location sits on the Wichita State University campus and is a museum dedicated to two entrepreneurs, including two Kansas brothers who changed the world. All right. So it looks like something to do with rockets. Um, there's moon and stars, a big capsule of some kind. We're at the, the, uh, the Cosmosphere in Hutch. So the Cosmosphere has been called the greatest space museum on planet Earth by actual real life NASA scientists. So we're not kidding around when we say the Cosmosphere is an incredible museum. And so there are a lot of people who wonder why this incredible space museum is located in the middle of Kansas. Uh, and it all came down uh, to a dream um, had by a local woman named Patty Carey, who was uh, a woman from Hutch who loved astronomy and wanted everyone to have a better chance to understand the sky above them and the earth on which they lived. So Patty launched her dream by opening a planetarium on the Kansas State Fairgrounds, the first of its kind in the state. That dream grew from there and now features the largest combined collection of US and former space, uh, Soviet space artifacts telling the story of the space race unlike any other museum in the world. And this is also the only place in the Midwest that houses a flown spacecraft from all three early uh, manned spaceflight programs. So they have the Mercury, Mercury, Liberty Bell 7, the Gemini X, and the Apollo 13 Odyssey, which 
If you're a movie buff, you might recognize the name Apollo 13, which was based on a real life story. And so the actual Apollo 13 capsule um, is right here in the middle of Kansas, just waiting for you to come and take a look. So I do want to leave this up here for a second. Um, again, my name is Jordan Romerman. I work for Kansas Tourism. Um, feel free to give us a holler if you have any questions about what to do or where to go in Kansas, but particularly for teachers. We do offer free travel guides, free maps of Kansas, free USB drives. Um, all of this stuff is free to you for Kansas students and in the classrooms. So please shoot me a message uh, if you'd want us to send any of those materials out. And for now, I will go ahead and hopefully shop, stop sharing my screen. And I think we might have some questions. Well, that was just very cool and amazing uh, journey you took us on, Jordan. I know I um, <laughs> jotted down a few things that I haven't been to that I want to go to. Kansas I've bucket list, get it started. The, I've never been to the little Jerusalem place ever, and I've lived here my whole life. It's our brand. It's it was our newest state park. It opened in I think October of 2019. So we actually just added a new state park here in uh, last July, I believe. So it's still pretty new, but it's really really cool. Cool. Um, one of the questions came in was um, out of all those that you showed us, do you have a favorite? <sighs> it depends on the mood that I'm in for the day. Um, <laughs> I am always really partial to the Cosmosphere. I grew up in Stafford, which is about 45 minutes away from Hutch. So I, I went to the Cosmosphere a lot growing up and it's been fun to see it change. Um, yes. I also like the kitschiness of the, uh, the Dalton Gang Museum. Um, and another one of my favorite places to go that I didn't mention is Lucas, Kansas, which is the grassroots arts capital of Kansas and has a bunch of really weird, funky art stuff. Cool. I know. I also enjoyed over there in Hutchinson that Salt Museum. Yes, that was really uh, fun. It's it's really it's the only open to the public uh, salt mine in North America, and really it's the only museum like it in the world. So you only get it here in Kansas. <laughs> check check it out, kids, if you get yes. a chance. Yes. Well, thank you so much for all of your expertise. Again, we've so enjoyed this, um, and kids. Maybe I challenge you guys to find a really cool place in Kansas that wasn't mentioned today, because I know there's more than what we just talked about. So, so many more. And let me know when you go. Yes, reach out to Jordan, um, teachers, for those free uh, resources she mentioned. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Happy Kansas Day.